citizens and strangers. Am I on? Hello. 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 Oh, there I am. All right. Welcome to Trademark. There's notes coming your way. There's Bibles coming your way in case you didn't bring a Bible with you tonight. And hopefully there's pens coming your way as well. We are on week three of our series, Citizens and Strangers. We're going through the Gospel of Matthew. Um, welcome. If you're new, I'm uh, Pastor Gabe. I'm one of the pastors here. So glad you're here. Um, so if you got your Bibles, you can turn to, no shocker, the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to be in chapter 13. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. When you're there, say, I'm there. Ooh, way early. Okay. Calm, calm down. Calm down, Gabe. Matthew 13. Are you there yet? Alma, you're there. Say I'm there. I know you don't want to show off, but. <laughs> all right, while you turn there, let me make a quick announcement. Um, as part of this series, we don't always do this, but as part of this, as part of this, this as part of this series, Summer, help me, right? As part of this series, we're going to have small groups at the end that kind of bring in some discussion about this. So, and leaders, this will be helpful too for you to listen. Um, if you are in middle school, middle school, you're going to exit through the back doors and you're going to end up in the couch room, the reserve, okay? If you are a young adult, meaning you're out of high school or you're at least 18, you're going to be with Titus and Joe. They're waving their hands right there. Bam. Where are you guys going to go? Corner? Oh, okay. <laughs> Corner. If you are in, in high school, um, you are going to be over here. But that's probably going to be split into two groups. So just be flexible. Okay, high schoolers, can you be flexible? It's Wednesday. We're making it. Okay, is everyone there? I stalled long enough. Matthew 13. We there? Okay, let me pray and we'll get into it. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we get into God's word tonight? Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the fun that we've already had, for the s'mores that we've enjoyed, for all the, the good times that have already happened. We thank you for the opportunity we, we just had to worship you to lift your name high, to push aside anything in this world that might be hindering our faith, that might be hindering our relationship with you and cling to you. God, we are Christians, so we're people of this book. We're people of your word. Lord, may your word speak to us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let me recap you of where we've been before we get to Matthew 13, verse 24. Um, in the first two weeks, we've looked at how this world was made. We went all the way back to Genesis, and we talked about how it's God's kingdom. It's God's kingdom. God created his kingdom. It's his. We also talked about how sin messed everything up, and uh, it, the sin was through the sin of Eve. She was the one who actually um, bit into the fruit, and Adam was also a sinner because he should have said something, right? He should have been like, no, bad idea, ah, right? Um, but he didn't. So there's, there's sin going on. Uh, and then we talked about, this was week one, we talked about how even in the middle of all that sin, God is so good that in the middle of all that sin, he promises that someone would come and crush the snake. That someone would come and crush the snake. The snake is, is, uh, is the devil, is Satan, right? So he po promises that someone would come and crush the snake. And then last week, we discovered that the snake crusher was someone who would come from the family of Abraham. We went all the way, we, we did a quick glimpse through the whole Old Testament that the snake crusher would come from the family of Abraham, and we learned that it would be a king, that the snake crusher wouldn't just be an ordinary guy, but he would be the king, and so we finally got to the big crescendo, which is Jesus is the promised king. Jesus is the promised king. We talk about this all the time, but the Bible is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus. And uh, that's going to be super evident as we go through the Gospel of Matthew. So it's his kingdom. And we talked about how his kingdom is better than expected, right? Everyone thought there'd be like this, this crazy dictator who just wanted to kill everyone who was against them. And Jesus comes and he's like, no, we're going to love people. They, they thought he'd be this economic guru who was going to make Israel rich. And he was like, no, we're going to give stuff away. And they were like, wow, this is totally different. But as we're studying, it's better than expected. And then we talked about this. His kingdom has already been established. He already came. He already lived. He already died. He already rose again from death. But it's not yet fully realized. When you look around the world, if we're being honest, right, 
and we should be honest, we're in church. If you look around the world, uh, there's a lot of sin everywhere. Sin is prevalent. And so even though this is Jesus' kingdom, and it's already begun, it's not fully realized, we're still working towards that. Um, so Jesus is the king. Now what? Now what, <laughs> right? We still live in this messed up world. Jesus is the king, so what is the way of Jesus? Um, you may be familiar with the American way. It's your way, you're an American, probably. And, um, and, and you might be familiar of hearing at least the phrase, the American way, or in Jesus' day, they would have said the way um, of, of Rome, the Roman way. It's a way of thinking, it's a way of living. So what's the way of Jesus? We're talking about how we're citizens in this world, but we're also strangers. We're not following necessarily the rules of this world. We're following the way of Jesus. What is the Jesus way? What will his kingdom look like? How will he rule and reign? When and where will we hear his state of the union? Okay, okay cool. <laughs> Some of you are like, what's that? It's okay. You're in middle school. You'll get there. Um, when is his state of the kingdom speech? In the Gospel of Matthew, you're going to hear this phrase. And I need to say all this before we get to Matthew 13, but I promise we're getting there. In the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew uses this phrase, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. He uses it a lot. And, and what he's trying to do with that is, is Matthew's trying to say these things or this way, this is how Jesus expects his people to live. This is what Jesus expects in his kingdom. This is the kingdom of heaven. And he'll compare it to things, and you're going to see that today. So in Matthew 13, verse 24, let's get started and hear, hear from God's word. 13, 24, he says this. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time... I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Pretty cool, right? A lot of symbolism there. The kingdom of heaven is compared to this stuff. So let's break it down. The kingdom of heaven, dot, dot, dot. I have a few points for that. You can fill these in along the way. The kingdom of heaven is ruled by a perfect farmer. A perfect farmer. Farmer. Matthew gets here. We're trying to learn what, what God's kingdom's like. Remember, everyone's expecting a mighty ruler with a fast horse and a huge army, and they're going to go to war with Rome, and they're going to win. And then Matthew says, you know what the kingdom of heaven is like? It's ruled by a perfect farmer. And I just feel like all the Jews were like, oh, what a letdown, right? Like, that sucks. Right? I, I want to I make Israel great again. I don't, I don't want a farmer, right? Like, like sorry, sorry. Um, it's ruled by a perfect farmer. And, and how do we know he's a perfect farmer? Well, you can actually read ahead. I would encourage you to do this. We're not going to read it all. But if you read the rest of chapter 13, the, the disciples get inside after he gives this whole crazy message. And they're like, Jesus, what the heck did that mean? Literally, you can read it later. It's like verse 40. Uh, what did you mean by all that? And then Jesus is like, oh, well, the farmer is, you know, me. And uh, the weeds are the sinful people in this world. And the wheat are my sons, the people who belong to my kingdom, my daughters and, and sons who are Christians. That, that's who it is. He explains the whole thing, which is really cool. Um, he doesn't always do that. It's nice when he does. Um, so we know that it's ruled by a perfect farmer. And we see that because he plants good seed. He plants good seed. Um, have any of you ever tried to do like a raised bed, like a garden in your backyard? Anyone? A few hands, okay? I haven't. Oh, I haven't. Um, so I've never tried it, but I feel like I would fail. I'm pretty sure I would fail. I've never killed a reptile. That's true, not yet. We're up to 14 pets at our zoo to, as we speak. 14 pets at Camp Carlson. Pray for us. 
the reptiles are taking over. <laughs> they are taking over. Okay. I have four tortoises now, guys. Four tortoises. Save the tortoises. Save the tortoises. I know. You guys are giving up straws. I'm actually adopting them. Yeah. Catch up. Yeah. Catch up. Okay. Um, he plants good seed, right? He plants good seed. And we talked about this last week. He is, and his kingdom is better than expected. He's not a demanding dictator. Instead, he, who's expecting perfection, which is what you could get, right? If a holy, righteous God who is perfect in all his ways wanted to rule and reign as he is, he could step in and say, I'm perfect, you better be perfect, and if you're not perfect, to hell with you. And he would be allowed to say that. Like, I can't say that because I'm not perfect. But God could get in front of us and say, I'm the king, and if you're not perfect, rot in hell. And instead of being this expecting perfection, demanding dictator, he comes in and Matthew's like, you know what? He's not like that. He's really like a patient farmer. He plants seed. He waits. He lets other people be involved, even though they clearly messed up. They fell asleep on the job. And, and, and he's like, I'm going to let man, I'm going to let, let people, I'm going to let humanity be involved in what I'm doing in my kingdom. And I'm not going to expect perfection. I'm going to be a patient farmer. He is a perfect farmer. Not only that, um, number two, you can fill this in. We see this in Matthew 13, and, and some people don't believe this, but you need to know that we believe this here. Um, in, in the kingdom of heaven, he has an enemy <laughs> for now, right? There, there's an enemy in um, the kingdom of heaven for now. Um, and, and we know that that's true, which you're like, what do you mean by that? We believe that Satan is real. We believe the devil is real. We believe demons are real. And uh, we, we also believe that he loses, right? Um, but, but he is real. And we see in this story that he comes in, in the dead of night, he plants bad seed. It's going to produce weeds. He plants bad seed. Satan is real and he is evil. And he's out to, and you need to know this, he's out to destroy God's kingdom and God's kids. And, and you and I, we're, we're children of God. And that's not because you're a kid. That's not because you're in your 20s. That's true whether you're 50, 60, 82. If you're a Christian, you're a child of God. And, and, and the enemy is real. And he's out to destroy not just the kingdom. Right? Sometimes people connect Christians to buildings. Right? The, the enemy isn't out just to like, make our churches fall apart, attack our, our camp in Big Bear. You know, he, he's not out just to do that, although he does certainly do that. He's also after you personally. He's after you personally. He's after God's kids. He wants to do whatever he can to destroy the kingdom, and you're part of the kingdom. And so the, the enemy's real. He has a real enemy. He'll lose, but he has a real enemy. Number three, I want to keep going because I want to leave plenty of space for you guys to have conversations later. Number three, we learn that um, in this kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is managed by mere men. Mere men. You would expect Jesus to show up and to just, what's the word I'm looking for? To just get micromanaging everything. Right? Dictate, micromanage, not here, there. No, you messed that up. It needs to be exactly this way and that way. And instead, he goes, you know what? I'm in charge. This is my kingdom. But you, men and women, you get to, like, run everything. You get to rule and reign. We, we learned a, a few weeks ago that, that we're kings and queens in this kingdom. We're kings and queens. You have a responsibility, which is really cool, and it's kind of a lot of pressure. You have, a lot, you have responsibility to manage the kingdom of heaven. And you're like, but I'm on earth. I know. I know. This is God's kingdom, all of it. Yeah. This is the kingdom of heaven. Um, so, so it's managed by mere men, good and bad men. Right? You can read through histories. We're writing our own history right now. There are good and, ma and bad men and women who are leading our world. There's good and bad men and women who are leading in our schools, even leading in our churches. Right? We see that. that pre that's prevalent everywhere. And, and God is in charge of all of it, and yet he allows us to be responsible for it. Super cool. Do you, do you ever remember, maybe the first time you can remember, actually, maybe what's the, the first time you can remember your parents really trusting you with something? Do you ever remember this? Can you think back? Like, you were probably really young. Some of you are like, they, they still don't trust me with anything. Um, I know. Um, sorry. Um, but there's something to that, like even now, I have a six-year-old, and, and there's something to like, even, even something like this. Think about how crazy this is for me as a dad. 
okay? I buy cereal, costs like three bucks. I buy milk, costs like two or three bucks. I buy bowls, spoons, all that stuff. Just to give him a bowl of cereal is great. He should eat. So this morning when he got his crunch berries, he likes crunch berries, um, and he said, Dad, I want crunch berries for breakfast. And I said, great. I poured the whole thing, gave it all to, get to him, and I went to go put it on the table. He said, Dad, can I carry it to the table? And inside I was like, heck no, you can't. You're not capable, right? I don't trust you with this little bit of milk and this little bit of cereal and that bowl. That bowl was probably 89 cents, right? Like, I can't trust you with that. You're going to destroy the earth, right? Like, <laughs> and, and, and yet I go, sure, right? Only I say it with confidence so he knows I believe in him, even though I, I don't, right? Like, you got this, kid. And so he grabs it and he's cocky because he's my kid. And so he's like, what I'm, what I'm hoping is he'll be like, all the way to the table, right? And what he's like is like, right, just like, all the way, and I'm like, ah, don't do it. Um, and he made it. <laughs> Give it up for Micah, he made it. I know, I know, I dropped mine, but he made it, so we're good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't drop things um, in front of people. Um, so it's managed by mere men. Good and bad men and women are running this thing, and as part of that, these men and women are requiring sleep. Right? It, it just makes sense. And, and here's what I don't want you to go. I don't want you to go home and be like, man, the guys in that story, they were supposed to be looking at that farm. They're supposed to be taking care of the seed. How hard is it to take care of something that doesn't move? Right? And they fell asleep on the job. You fall asleep all the time, or at least you should because you require sleep. In fact, God's word says you must rest. So, so these men, I don't think they're even bad guys. I think they're good guys. And they just required sleep. And they fell asleep. And everything fell apart. And the weeds came, and they didn't even know what happened. Have you ever let your life fall apart, and you didn't know what happened? <laughs> You're like, yeah, literally today. I was supposed to turn in an assignment. Had it for weeks. Didn't get it done. Um, <laughs> your life's falling apart, and you didn't even know you let it fall apart like weeks ago. I I'm with you. I've been there. But he's better than expected, right? We keep saying that. That's not a fill in the blank, but you should write that somewhere. God is better than expected. His kingdom is better than expected. And, and, and this is better than expected. He allows us to lead. He allows us to serve and rule and work in his kingdom, but knows we are only humans. He knows we're only humans. He's not expecting you to be God. He's not expecting you to be perfect. He's not expecting you to be angelic, even if you get the, the mirror with all the lights that makes you look really pretty. You're not supposed to or expected to be angelic. Instead, he gives us tools to protect, right? He, you still have wisdom. There are times you shouldn't go to sleep. There are times you should stay up and work hard. There are times you should guard whatever God's entrusted you with, right? That, that's just part of it. He gives us tools, but he doesn't blame us for the enemy's work. I want you to see that. There are things that happen in life, and it's completely your fault. It's completely your fault. And you'll blame your parents, and you'll blame your friend, and you'll blame America, and you'll blame your president, and you'll blame your governor, and you'll blame your teacher. And it's really your fault, 100% your fault, and you should grow up and take responsibility. And there's things where the enemy is just at work and there was nothing you could do about it. And the enemy just came in and he does what he does. He lies, he kills, he destroys, he goes after you. And it happens. And that's part of life too. So we have to sit in this and go, okay, what's my fault? What's his? And the whole time we're trusting God. The whole time we're trusting God. It, it, it's managed by mere men. Number four, we learn this. Weeds and wheat look similar to us. Weeds and wheat look similar to us. God is good to both. Hear that out, right? So, so it's hard for us to tell because none of us are farmers. We have no idea what it looks like. I almost got a picture, but um, when, when the weeds and the wheat would sprout up in this time, when they were young and they started to come out of the ground, they would look almost identical. You could tell a little bit, but if you could see a whole field, you wouldn't know. Me and you would look at it and be like, oh, that's a field full of weeds, of wheat, wheats, mini wheats. Where does wheat come from? Um... <laughs> <laughs> and we would look out there and go, look at all that wheat. And the farmer would be like, that's all weeds. And we'd be like, oh, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> right? Like, and, and so, but God is good to both because listen, these guys, they're excited. They're like, all right, this messed up. The enemy came, the enemy planted bad seed. What are we gonna do? Should we go get it all? And, and, and the farmer's like, hey, <laughs> relax. Why do they need to relax? Well, he says, because if you go out there and you just start digging up everything that looks like a weed, you're gonna get some of the stuff that, that's good seed. You're going to get some wheat, too. 
And so we have to wait this thing out. We have to let this go all the way to the end. And when the, the, the end comes, we'll deal with it. But for now, you just got to let it grow. Tell your neighbor, let it grow. Let it grow. See, here's what's cool. Here's what's cool. Just let it grow. Nothing more. Don't give them, don't give them life advice. You're not a therapist, right? Um, God is good to both. Think about this. The whole time the wheat and the weeds are growing up, are they getting watered? Absolutely. Are they getting the same sun? Absolutely. Are they getting cared for the same way? Absolutely. Are they getting protected from, from enemies to come in and, and, and steal some of them? Absolutely. God is good to both. He waters and protects both. Good things happen to Christians and non-Christians. Right? The wheat represents Christians. The weeds represent non-Christians. And you just need to hear this. Good things and bad things happen to both. My, my son came home the other day, and he was like, Dad, I learned something cool today. I was like, oh, cool, what'd you learn? Karma. I was like, you didn't learn anything today. You're, <laughs> what, who taught you that? Oh, my friend Raymond. He's six. Don't learn anything from Raymond. Um, so you guys have heard a lot about Raymond. Raymond's getting better. Let me just tell you. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I have to break down. Like, karma's not a real thing. Listen, good and bad things happen to everyone. Good and bad things happen to everyone. Like, when I, when I fly on planes... People look at me, they're like, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a pastor. They're like, oh, good. I'm like, why is that good for you? Well, now I know the plane won't go down. <laughs> Listen, if this plane goes down, I'm rejoicing. Does that make you feel good? No, exactly. Right? Like, you know, I've never actually had that conversation, but I really want it. Okay. Um, <laughs> good things happen to both. All receive, hear this out, all receive general grace. And God is wise enough, hear me, God is wise enough to not leave it up to us. And, and some of you need to hear this. I know I need to hear this as a pastor. I need to hear this as a dad. I need to hear this as a man. Remember, it's not up to you to decide who is a Christian and who isn't. It's, it's not up to you. We, we love, and that may require conversations that are tough. So I, I might have the privilege of just assuming you're all Christians, but that doesn't mean I get to let you get away with whatever you want. I still have to call sin, sin. I still have to call you to something better than you're doing. I have to call you to live in this better than expected kingdom because you're a better than expected result of the kingdom. And so I have to call you to that. I have to draw you there. You have to do that for each other as well. But we don't get to judge and to say, you know, you shouldn't come to church anymore. You're not a Christian. It's not up to us. Weeds and wheat look similar to us, which also means the verdict's still out on you in my eyes. Right, I love you. I believe most of you are Christians. I can see God's fruit in you. I can see you doing amazing things. But I, I've been doing, I've been a youth pastor for 10 years. Uh, 10 years later on some of these, it's like, yeah, they, they're not a Christian. <laughs> right, like they're so far gone. Clearly, they were just faking it. Yeah. And, and that can happen, and that's okay. Because, number five, in God's kingdom, he has a furnace. You're like, dang, it was all fun and games till hell got involved. Right. Um, in God's kingdom, he has a furnace. See, this isn't forever. We don't just get to fake. You can fake me out. You can fake your leaders out. You can fake your best friend out in the seat next to you. But eventually, eventually, when the harvest gets drawn up and they're separating the wheat and the weeds, notice that the weeds get bundled up first and they get thrown into the furnace. They get thrown into hell. The time is coming slowly, slowly, but surely, where all the weeds will be bundled together and burned. This is a promise for a beautiful heaven because that means that heaven won't include any weeds. It won't include any evil people. It'll just include those who God has saved. And this is a reminder for those who are not in Christ to get your life sorted out. Know who Jesus is. Know that he's the king of kings and the lord of lords, and you can fake it in front of me, and you can fake it in front of your parents, you can fake it to whoever you want. You're not going to fake him out. And when the time comes, and we don't preach like this a lot, like, when the time comes, though, if you're not in him, you're going to burn. Yeah. Gnashing of teeth. It's, it's not a good picture. Uh, the Bible describes it in some terrible ways. One way is gnashing of teeth, and you get kind of this, this fire and brimstone idea. Another way is just a big pile of, of rotting, fiery poop. I'm serious. <laughs> You're like, dang, I need to read the Bible more. I know, it's so good. Um, the, hell is like this big pile of poop outside of a mega city, right? Like it's just this massive thing. 
So it has a furnace. Let's keep reading. Go to verse 31. I want to give you two more things, and then I want to give you the big idea, and we'll get you to groups. In verse 31, he kind of jumps on to this, and he's like, I don't think they're getting the weeds and wheat picture. Let me give them two more easier to understand pictures. Matthew 13, 31. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman, put, that, that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour, Till it was all leaven. And so the idea is this. He's just trying to paint this picture. Listen, when, when we broke down a lot of this, but you need to understand this. The kingdom of heaven started so small, and it's growing and growing and growing. And eventually it's going to be like a mustard seed where it started really tiny. But in time, as you let that thing grow, it becomes a mighty tree. So mighty that birds can rest and find nest inside of it. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's not a failing kingdom. It's not a kingdom that dies in the end. It's a kingdom that gets better and better and better, which is why we're one of the only people who can say the best really is yet to come. Because when anyone who's not a Christian says that, they have no idea that cancer is around the corner. And we could say, even with cancer around the corner, and I've had, and, and I have a disease, I've been through some stuff, even in the face of all of that, we know the best is yet to come because the kingdom promises it. Because the king, the promised king says, heaven gets better and better and better, and we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The gospel is expanding. The gospel is growing. The whole earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So what's the important big idea points for this? Well, first is this. Faith is proven over time. Faith is proven over time. You can fill that in. Faith is proven over time. You, you may come to church, you may call yourself a Christian, I may think you're a Christian, but it's too early to tell. How many of you saw Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? Okay. Churches aren't equipped with the Willy Wonka egg decator. You know what I'm talking about? The egg decator, where, where a good egg and a bad egg, they, they go on this, this tray, and then it goes, don't, 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 good egg, don't, 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 good egg, don't, bad egg, right? And that, that ugly little girl, she sits on it. You're like, you just called the girl ugly. She's a bad egg. Okay, um, sits on it, and, and it goes, oh, bad egg, and she goes down the chute, and, and she should die, but it's Willy Wonka, right? Like, and uh, so churches don't have that, right? Like, we don't have a scale like, oh, before you come in, before we hand you a Bible, before I shake your hand, would you just stand here? I need to know. I just need to know. Are you wheat or weeds? Are you Christian or not? Are you good or bad? Can you just stand here before I give you a hug? Because I need to know. We don't have one. They're too expensive. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> they don't exist, right? It's not up for me to know or you to know. We don't get to do that. But you can fake it. But you'll never make it if you're faking it, yeah. right? You, you need to make sure you're in Christ. Make sure you're not banking on a one-time event. Make sure you're not banking on, well, I went to church when I was a kid. Well, I go to church sometimes. Well, I've read the Bible once or twice. Like, you can't bank on that. Are you with him? Are you in Christ? Like, well, how do I know? Well, do you love him? Like, do you really love him? Do you love Jesus? Do you serve him? You're like, serve him? What am I supposed to be doing? Giving him your whole life, something like that. Serving him. Do you live for him? Do you submit to him? Does this book have more authority than your brain? Do you submit to him? Grow in the Lord. Abide in him. Abide in him. Number two, this is big. You can belong before you believe. You know, we don't have an egg decator. We have no way of knowing if you believe or not. But you can belong here before you believe. You, you can come here, worship here, be a part of what we do here, no matter who you are. Please hear that. No matter who you are. Christian or not, confused, asking questions, forced to come by your parents, grandparents, friend, girlfriend, boyfriend, it doesn't really matter. You can belong here even if you don't believe. You, you can be a part of what we're doing even if you're still trying to figure it out. And, and, and you can be here, and, and I don't want you to hear like, well, they don't want me. No, that's the exact opposite. You belong here. 
You belong here. And, and, and in time, we'll see. In time, you'll see. Right? But the kingdom of heaven grows. And God is good. He is a patient, perfect farmer. You belong here, even if you don't believe. Number three, there's always room for more. There's always room for more. The whole earth is the Lord's. He is the Lord of all of it. There's not a place on this planet that doesn't belong to the King of Kings, that doesn't belong to Jesus. That first world, third world, it doesn't matter. It's all His. The world is the field. It's the field where the harvest is, where the weeds and the wheat are. The whole world is that. It's not some little thing in the backyard. It's not some three acres of land. It's the whole world. And so then us as Christians, if you're in here as a Christian, we're called to evangelize the world. We're called to go and tell people about Jesus, tell people about the good things that the Lord has done. We're supposed to send missionaries around the world. Literally, we're supposed to send missionaries around the world. And, and it's weird. It's like we're not sending missionaries anymore. It's like, it's like people just aren't ready to give up their lives to go die. We used to send missionaries out without luggage. They would pack their luggage in coffins because they expected to die. And now it's hard to get anyone to even go overseas for two weeks. We send out missionaries because in the middle of Africa and in an island that they don't even have technology, it's all the Lord's. That's all part of the field. It doesn't matter if it's, it's Muslim saturated or if, if the gospel has never been preached there. It's the Lord's. It's the Lord. So we evangelize the world and we tell our community. We evangelize Moreno Valley, Riverside County. We tell our community. We tell our schools. We tell our families who Jesus is. We tell each other who he is. It's funny, maybe sometimes we can't even think about going to the world because we can't think about even telling our closest relationship. We tell each other who he is. There's room for you here. There's room for your family here. There's room for your friends here. There's room for your enemies here. There's room. I'm gonna close with this. Um, One, I wanna give a gospel call tonight. Christ died on the cross. And, and rose from death in order to forgive your sins and give you everlasting life. That's the truth of the gospel. That's the truth of Jesus. And this is true for you. P- perhaps you're new, and this is new news. This is still true for you. P- perhaps you've been around for a while, you've belonged for a while, and y- you don't yet believe or you haven't yet believed, and it's all starting to make sense. This is true for you. Receive the gospel tonight. Give your life to your king. Give your life to Jesus. Uh, it, it, it's a miracle, which is why like, you're like, how do I be, go from become, being a weed to a wheat? Well, it's a miracle. God died on the cross and he rose again that you might be in him. So give your life to him. Receive the gift of forgiveness and freedom from your sins. Submit to Jesus as the Lord. That's my call for you guys. And then in a little bit, in just seconds, we're gonna have gospel conversations. They're small groups. They're just small groups of people talking about what we just heard. As Christians, or even just those who belong before they believe, we need to discuss the truths of God's word. We need to talk about life as citizens and strangers with a gospel hope. So that's what we're going to do. And and, and I'll remind you, and then I'll pray, and I'll send you to your groups, and we got uh, got like 12 minutes leaders. So let me pray. Remember that um, young adults are going over here. That's 18 and up adults. Middle schoolers are going to the couch room. High schoolers are over here. If the group's too big, we'll split into two. Let's pray. I, uh, you're over there. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the, the message that we have. Thank you for the promise we have. Thank you that you are king. Thank you that you're not an, a, a crazy dictator, but you're a patient farmer. Lord, help us to realize this truth. Help us to, to realize that, that we can belong before we believe. Help us to realize that faith is proven over time. And Lord, fill us with passion for the lost. That, that remind us that there's always room for more. Bless the conversations that are going to happen in these next 10 minutes. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, go ahead. You might need to take a chair with you. Go to your...